Hallelujah. Well, if you could, let's gather in and let's go and focus prayer tonight. So thankful for everybody that's come out. Praise the Lord. Believe in God for miracles, signs, and wonders. We're asking the Lord to touch hearts tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Have you come to worship Him? Have you come to worship the Lord tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Let's lift our voice in praise tonight. Father, we thank you. You're so good to your people. We worship you. You're the most high, the king of kings, righteous one, the holy one of Israel, the one that supplies the comforter to the church. You are the bright and morning star. Hallelujah. The first and the last. We glorify you. We magnify you. You are worthy, O Lord, of all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Hallelujah. We humbly come before you, O God, seeking repentance, O Lord, seeking forgiveness, Lord, that you would seek into our hearts, Lord, and look for anything that's not like you. Lord, that you would cleanse us, O Lord, and purify us and sanctify us in this hour. Wash us with your royal blood. Cleanse us, O God, and sanctify us and set us aside for your kingdom. Lord, to prepare us, O God, for your presence. To be able to walk into that glorious move of your presence tonight. To come boldly into the throne of grace. Hallelujah. O God, we seek you tonight. It is our desire, O God, that your will will be done in the kingdom. Lord, that your will will be first in our hearts. That you are first and foremost in our minds in our lives, in our ministries, in our homes. Oh God, in everything that we are, uh, hope to be, Father, that you are first. We pray, pray in Jesus' name for your presence to fill this room, that the glory of the Lord would be in our hearts, that the glory of the Lord would be around us, that the glory of the Lord would be upon each one, uh, upon our minds, on our hearts. Hallelujah. That your dominion, your glorious power, would it come, Lord, in a mighty way that the flood of the glory of God would come into this place. Hallelujah. We loosen healings. We loosen signs and wonders. We ask for a powerful move of the Holy Ghost. We ask God for encouragement in the house. We seek the comfort of the Holy Ghost. We ask for revelation, Lord. Hallelujah in a mighty way to reveal your word to us tonight as preached by the minister tonight. We seek you, God, for an anointing. Hallelujah. That we can bind our enemy. Hallelujah. That Satan is bound in darkness. It has to flee. We take authority in the name of Jesus and cast out doubt and fear. We take authority over sickness and command it to leave. We take authority over weariness and ask, oh God, that the Holy Ghost would bring us into great courage and strengthen our bodies. In the name of Jesus, we declare your glory. Hallelujah. We declare your glory. We know you're about to move in this place in a mighty way. And we declare the victory of the Holy Ghost. We declare a mighty move of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We seek God that the spirit of revival would be loosed in this place. That it would continue, Lord, throughout the next few months, oh God. That we would see a mighty outpouring of your spirit. That souls would be added to the church such as should be saved. That the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be on the preaching and on the singing. And a powerful move of your spirit. Oh God, we've come into this place to lift our hands, to clap our hands, to lift our voices and to sing your songs. We have come into this place to worship you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just worship with us today. If you just want to step forward, anybody that's able. The song talks about giving us a reason to dance. What's your reason today? I've got so many reasons to dance. But my number one reason is that I know who my, who my God is. I know the name of Jesus.
don't need convinced tonight. Not to worship him. He's worthy already. He's worthy. You know he's worthy. Lift your voice. Magnify the Lord. you take your petition into the kingdom right now right into the king throne room come on right into the throne room of God right now just take your petition in uh, your hungriness uh, your willingness uh, your thirstiness uh, hallelujah he that hunger and thirsteth after righteousness the same shall be filled who wants to be full tonight who wants to be full tonight who wants to be full tonight? Who's hungry for a move of God? Who desires a move of God tonight? I'm hungry, God. I need you, Jesus. Ooh. Breathe it in, breathe it in. There's life in the air right now. There's life in the air. Hallelujah. <laughs> used to be a song. I just love to listen to it. Hallelujah. But Donald Lawrence, he said, I, I speak life. You're going to live, my brother. Hallelujah. I speak life. You're going to live and not die. Is there somebody in the house that needs to live and not die tonight? Somebody that needs just a Holy Ghost spark within them. Maybe you came to revival tonight looking for an answer. Looking for the will of God for your life. Well, I want you to know God's already made it out. Your will. Your, His desire for your life. It is God's will that all men raise their hands. Hallelujah. That they magnify the Lord. It is God's desire for you to be a worshiper. Are there any worshipers in the house tonight? Is there anybody in the house willing to submit themselves unto the Most High? Yay! Jesus. Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, sing it, psalmist, sing it, hallelujah. Say I'm a kingdom. I'm part of the kingdom and I just need what I need from the Lord tonight. 
I'm so glad for you that have come, that have been here all weekend. I need you to just step into the presence of God. Say, I need what I need tonight. Tomorrow may be a trouble. Tomorrow might be a weakness. Tomorrow may be a, a real struggle. I need you to step into the will of God tonight and worship and receive and breathe. I need you to breathe.
He's glorious. He's holy. He's faithful. Don't you love it when the Lord shows up? Somebody once said it like uh, when the Lord shows up and then he starts to show off. Hallelujah. Showing how he's powerful, how he's merciful, how he's strong, how he's glorious. Oh, how he knows what you need. <laughs> and he begins to feed you. And he begins to speak to you. And he begins to minister to you. And he begins to encourage you and comfort you. Ah, you ought to receive it right now. You ought to say it's mine. I declare it in Jesus' name. I receive it in Jesus' name. Go ahead and raise your hands all over that. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. You've been seeking. You've been seeking for an answer. You've been seeking for some help from heaven. You've been seeking for a healing. You've been seeking for a deliverance. Hallelujah. You've been fighting that in your mind. I want you to know that the devil is on the road. And victory is in your house. Say, victory is in my house. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 After the Levite fell dead from touching the, the Ark of the Covenant, they decided we're going to take this thing. <laughs> We don't know how to handle this Ark of the Covenant. We need to go do some study, but we're going to park it down here at Obed Edom's house. So they took it down to Obed Edom's house. And it wasn't long till the, till the king found out that Obed Edom was being blessed. Hallelujah. And that's what happens when you take the presence of God home with you. You're blessed. You're blessed. You're going to start seeing doors open. You're going to start seeing revival in your household. You're going to start seeing your vision uh, begin to be clear. You're going to start seeing revelation happen in your life. God is going to start revealing to you. Oh, Bed Edom was blessed. And I want you to know your Holy Ghost filled people are blessed. Hallelujah. The enemy wants to tell you you're the dreg, that you're the lowest, that you're not worthy, you're no good. But I want you to know that you're God's called. You're God's people. You're God's. You belong to Him. He bought you with a price. You are not your own. Ah. You belong to the Lord. Everybody, turn to somebody and say, Dear brother, dear sister, you belong to the Lord. Dear brother, you belong to the Lord. Dear sister, you belong to the Lord. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody else and do it again. Do it again. Dear sister, you belong to the Lord. Ha-ha. Dear brother Bill, you belong to the Lord. Yeah. Woo. Brother Leroy, you belong to the Lord. Woo. Shama manana no Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So glad to have Brother David Voorhees with us tonight and his family. Give him a hand. Praise God. Praise the Lord. This this kind guest over here has been worshiping with us. Let's give her a hand. Nine, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
uh, my dear friend, Brother Bill, and, and the lady with him. Is it your wife? Yes. Okay, his wife. Praise God. Let's give them a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't want to speak out of turn. <laughs> Praise God. Did I cover everybody? Thank you, Jesus. Don't you feel the Holy Ghost in here? Oh, young man right here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, His last name's Quick. Logan. Come on up here, Brother Logan. <laughs> Hallelujah. And give us a testimony tonight. Praise the Lord. Whew. Of all the hours I've spent at his house, I tell you, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm thankful for the presence of revival. I'm excited to hear the word from Brother Reveille. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. I'm thankful... Um, for the move that I felt in the house of God today and for the move that you all experienced here today. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. He is a great and a mighty God. I'm thankful for His presence. I'm thankful for that sweet, sweet Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, if you don't have it, get it. And if you got it, use it. I'm thankful for it. God bless. Thanks, the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to have Brother Russell with us tonight. Why don't you give Brother Russell and Sister Frida a hand as he stands up to give us a testimony. I'm just thankful for another opportunity to be in his house and be a great present here tonight. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a blessing it is to have the... Dr. Re Joel Reveille with us. He's been an encouragement. Has, hasn't he been a blessing to y'all? Yes, yes. Amen. Such a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We'll take an offering here uh, in, in a, later in the service. Praise the Lord. So hang in there with us. But I want to invite Brother Joel Reveille to come up. Hallelujah. Now, you've all had revival, and I have had fellowship. Praise the Lord. This fellow right here has uh, fellowed my ship quite a bit. <laughs> we, had, we sat down and talked for four hours uh, yesterday afternoon, and then we talked for two hours yes, last night. And then today we talked for two or three hours, praise the Lord. And we have just been, we have come kindred spirits. Hallelujah. And I appreciate this young man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A worker in the kingdom. Don't you appreciate Brother Reveille? Thank you. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. I appreciate your shepherd as well. Don't you have a blessed pastor here at Blackwell Pentecostal Church? Thank you for your ministry and your testimony here in this area. And for all of you, thank you for being a part of the work of the Lord right here during this revival. You are a part and a portion of the army of heaven. You have put on your armor of battle. You have kept on the helmet of salvation. You have girded the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. Let me say something about the shield of faith, though, dear soldiers of the Lord. A friend of mine pointed out to me several years ago that we often think of the shield as a purely defensive weapon. But if you study ancient warfare, the shield also had offensive uses. If the enemy got really close to you, I mean too close for you to whip, whip the sword out and just cut him, if he was very close to you, you would take your shield and just go boop and knock him down. So when the enemy gets close up to your face, in your personal space, in your bubble, bless God, what you ought to do is take that shield of faith and say, I believe, get out of my sight, boom, get away from me. Use the shield of faith as an offensive weapon. Get the enemy out of your circle and ability to influence my life. Praise God. I thank God for his work and his word here. And tonight, the Lord has a Holy Ghost appointment. So if you have your Bibles, 
2 Kings chapter 23, verse 28. Thank you to all of our visitors. Thank you to my friends, brother and sister Douglas back there from ABC. Thank you for making the journey out here. The long distance trip from Bloomington, Indiana. Praise God. Hallelujah. Love my friends. This area is a region in the Holy Ghost. So the revival that you're having here will also affect other people in other churches. I told pastor this prophetic word this afternoon that I felt like what God was doing here, the oil the Lord was pouring into this golden candlestick, into this church, would touch the other churches here around and surrounding you. So thank God for his spirit moving here at Blackwell, but also thank God for that oil of the Lord spreading and also flowing in other churches and apostolic places surrounding us. Hallelujah. 2 Kings 23, verse number 28. If you're there, say, I'm there. Praise God. That was about a third of you, bless God. And so I'll give you one more second here to turn to that passage here in the Old Testament. I'm going to read to you about the end of the life of a man named King Josiah. 2 Kings 23, verse 28. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. Whenever you read that sentence, you're about to read about the death or the passing of one of the kings. In his days, verse 29... Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him, speaking about the Pharaoh. And this Pharaoh killed King Josiah. He slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. Footnote, Megiddo, if I have this right, is the location of the upcoming battle of Armageddon in the end of the age. And so this is a very important locality in the scriptures, all right? Verse 30, when this happened, his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him back to his city, Jerusalem, buried him in his own sepulcher. Now, this passage is a mournful passage. It's a sad passage. But there's something powerful God is trying to speak to us. There's something very important here in these verses. Now, I'm going to give you a warning label on this message. I have a colorful title for this sermon. I'm going to call this sermon, Stupid Battles. Stupid Battles. We have all fought stupid battles in our lives, haven't we? Lord, I ask you to move here in our midst. Speak to us. Let us have ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And you get the credit, Lord Jesus. All the glory and the praise goes to you. Let us be conduits of your power, our Creator. Let us be willing vessels. Lord God, move in us. Use us. Take my life, Lord God, and bring us where you desire for us to be. Shape us and make us. And we all say, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse number 1. It began thus with a very different king in a very different setting. Once upon a time in the Word of God, there was a man named King Jeroboam. King Jeroboam split the kingdom of Israel. King Jeroboam took 10 out of the 12 tribes and took them off up north and formed a new kingdom in Mount Samaria. You will often hear this kingdom referred to as Samaria or just Israel because they had the bulk of the population of Israel. And Jeroboam, he had the bulk of the people. He had the majority of the tribes. But what he did not have, he did not have Judah and also Benjamin. And in the tribe of Judah in the south was Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem was the house of God. And in the house of God was the presence of God. So he was missing something essential. He was missing the voice of the man of God. He was missing the house of God. And he was missing the presence of God. And without the house of God and the presence of God and the man of God, my life is incomplete. I need the voice of the Lord. I need the apostolic pulpit. I need the word of God. Praise God. Now, Jeroboam realized pretty quick 
that if he let the people just kind of do their own thing, then eventually the people would be pricked in their hearts by some prophet of the Lord or by some Levite or priest. At some point, God will, would call his people back to repentance. That always happens here in the Word of God. He knew this, and so he knew perhaps in his fleshly mind that he had to do something about that. And so Jeroboam begins to lead the people off in sin. If you read the 12th chapter and the 28th verse, you will read that King Jeroboam in chapter 12 and verse 28 actually made two golden calves. He literally made golden calves. He took them back to Egypt worship. When somebody leaves the house of God, there is no telling how far they'll go. When somebody no longer entertains the presence of God, they'll go back to things they left behind generations ago. It is astounding. It's crazy. It's insane. So how do I solve that? How do I fix that? A solution is not to leave the house of God in the first place, to remain, to maintain, and to keep going forward in the name of Jesus. So back to the 13th chapter here. King Jeroboam was backsliding. King Jeroboam had some false idols and a false altar that he had built in a place called Bethel. There, while King Jeroboam was standing by his false altar in Bethel. Footnote, Bethel means the house of God in Hebrew. Bethel is where Jacob had the ladder vision and the ladder dream back in Genesis. It was a place of vision, and Jeroboam made it a place of backsliding, and God was not happy. And God sent a man of God out of Judah. God sent somebody out of the place where people were still living for God. Why is this house of God so important? Because even though there are houses of worship that have compromised truth, this house has not compromised truth. This is Judah, and out of Judah come true preachers. Out of Judah come true worshipers of God in spirit and in truth. People receive calling still in houses of God just like this house of God. And so I thank God for you all. I thank God for your lives and testimonies and families and ministries right here at Blackwell. As long as you are continuing you on, you are opening the doorway of revival year after year for this area. Out of Judah, a man of God came and spoke to this man, Jeroboam. He spoke the word of the Lord to him. And he stood by the altar at that time, Jeroboam did, and he was burning incense at that false altar. And in verse 2, the prophet does something kind of interesting. He actually doesn't speak directly to Jeroboam. You see, Jeroboam don't want to hear from God anymore. And when you don't want to hear from God, God will stop talking to you. And so God did not talk to Jeroboam. He talks to the altar instead. And so this man cries against the altar in the word of the Lord. O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David. And it gives his name. What is his name? Josiah by name. Upon thee, this false altar, Josiah would offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon that false altar. On that false altar, he would burn men's bones, the bones of of the false priests. So that was the word of the Lord. That was the prophetic word about King Jeroboam to come. Now, when I read this prophecy of King Jeroboam to come, I see a prophecy of a man who will burn the bones of false preachers upon their own false altars. Now, in my head, I'm just talking to you here using my own terminology, all right? Forgive me. In my head, I see some guy like a superhero or something like that. You know, some guy who's a muscle-bound bodybuilder, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, Hulk out type, some man who's picking up a false priest with with one hand and slinging him on the altar and overturning the altar and lighting it on fire with the other hand. I have this mental image of this super individual, like a giant or some kind of strong muscle-bound warrior. But we know in the church that oftentimes it don't work like that. That when God fulfills a word, oftentimes it doesn't go according to our assumptions or expectations. Second Kings 22 in verse number 1. Let us read the fulfillment of Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. 
See, I was expecting some kind of Superman, but instead I get a fourth grader. I get an eight-year-old boy. That was not what I was looking for in that prophecy, all right? Or a third grader here. He was eight years old. I wasn't expecting an eight-year-old, and yet there he is. There is the man who is the fulfillment of God's prophetic word so many chapters before. It wasn't what I thought it would be. See, I wanted the fruit, or I wanted at minimum the tree itself, but instead God gives me a seed. And so oftentimes, I am praying for the tree or for the fruit for my life. But instead, God gives me the seed and asks me to plant the seed in the soil of my life. And then by faith to water it with my prayers and with my tears. And if I watch and if I wait on the Lord, as that song says, it was in the Holy Ghost tonight, music team. Thank you to all of you here in the house of God. You were in the Lord by singing that song, Wait on the Lord, because when you plant that seed, you will do a whole lot of waiting, but if you believe and if you continue on, that seed will sprout up, become a tree that does bear fruit in your life. Have the faith to keep walking and worshiping and waiting while the seed grows in God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was an eight-year-old, only a seed, okay? But he was a good man. He was a good boy. Verse 2, he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was going to be a good king, okay? And in the third verse, it came to pass in the 18th year. The 18th year would be 17 years later. He was 25 years old. At age 25, he has his first major royal act. At age 25, he gathers some of his workers, the scribes and the men of God. They all gather, and they go to the house of the Lord. He tells them here, go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. That was an Old Testament building fund. They would gather money at the door of the temple for repairing the house of God. And he tells them in verse 5 to give this building fund to the people who are the doers of the work, that they would repair the house of the Lord, repair the breaches of the house. The first act of King Josiah is to repair the broken things in the house of God. Now, this was a renovation project and program here in the house of the Lord in the Old Testament. And, dear shepherd, I have heard this all my life. I have heard that you can't have revival in a building program. Anybody ever heard that before? You can't have revival in a building program. But they were in a building program, and God was about to birth mighty revival in the middle of their building program. Well, how do you have revival in a building program? It's simple. You've got to be a doer of the work and just do what God has given into your hand the ability to do and accomplish. Just do what God has gifted you to do and God will do the rest. Be a doer of the work. Be a doer of the word like James said. Do what God has given you the power to do and that will be enough. They give the funds to the carpenters in verse 6, and the builders and the masons, the timber, the woodworkers. And they begin their work of repair. And they're just doing what they can, shoring up the breaches, plugging the gaps, making good the house of God. In the midst of doing all that, repairing the house of the Lord, just like when Nehemiah repaired the wall several centuries later. In verse 8, a discovery was made. During the repair work, Hilkiah the high priest, he says unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. In Second Chronicles, it's even clearer. It's the books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. Now, we think this was probably the last copy of the Bible. See, there was a king a few kings back named Manasseh that I preached about this morning. And Manasseh killed worshipers of God, but Manasseh also burned copies of the Bible. He killed people who worshiped God, and he tried to stamp out every last copy of the Old Testament Bible. And he thought he had eliminated the Word of God. 
But mark this down, dear friends. Long after Manasseh was dust and went the way of the dodo, the word of God was still around. There was somebody who had one last copy. The word of God will last longer than our current cultural arguments. The word of God will go beyond our current political fights. The word of God will endure past whatever conflicts and conflagrations we are in right now. The word of God will last beyond whatever I am going through. And this night season I am enduring. The word of God will stand the test of time. It will be that which remains when all else has passed and gone away. The word of God is forever. There was one last copy. Somebody had hid it in the temple. In all likelihood, whoever hid that Bible copy probably paid with his life. Somebody likely gave their life to hide that copy of the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But there it was, and he found it. And when you find the Word of God, what do you do? You read it. He gave the book to Shaphan, and what did he do? He read it. When you find the unaltered, the unadulterated, the undiluted Word of God, what do you do? You read it. What do you do when you have a Bible in your home? Or what should you do, bless God? You should read it. Pick it up. Turn the pages and see what thus saith the Lord. I'm going to get on something here real quick here in the house of God. I have heard this statement said many times. I need to hear from God. And I've been there too. There are services where I come to revival and I need to hear the word of God. But let me also tell you something. In some moments, yes, God will speak to you from the pulpit. But there are different moments where God will also speak to you from the word of God. If you need a word of God, please open up the word of God and see what heaven has to say to you. Hallelujah. He read it just like those ministers in Topeka, Kansas did about a century ago. Just like ministers did in Los Angeles, California on Azusa Street back in 1906. There are people who read the Word of God, read about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost at a Royal Sico camp meeting about a century ago, read about Jesus' name, baptism. There have been men who always, always have based their salvation and theologies upon the Word of God. They read it. They take this copy of the Bible to the king himself. And at first, they kind of meander around before they tell the king about this, you know. They kind of lowball this and don't tell him at first. And then in verse 10, after talking to him about some updates in the building project, the scribe Shaphan tells the king, he shows him and said, Hilkiah the high priest gave me a book, delivered me a book. And all that scribe does is open the book up and he begins to read it before the king. And in verse 11, the king didn't need any assistance. He knew what that book was. Because when you hear a true word of God, you know. No one has to tell you. When you have been in a Pentecostal revival, and then after 20 years, 10 years, however long it's been, when once more you find yourself in a move of the Holy Ghost, you know the difference. You remember what it felt like that night when God filled you up to the brim with the power of the Lord and the Spirit of God that we call the Holy Ghost. You know what it felt like to speak in tongues as that Spirit surged through your life. You know that God is real. You know what it felt like to feel the Spirit of God. When you hear the truth, you know the difference. As the word of God said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what I'm doing when I lift up my hands like this. I'm tasting and seeing in that presence of the Lord. I am partaking of the original. And when you have tasted the original, you have no desire or taste for counterfeits or knockoff religion, do you? So he heard the word of God. The king heard the words of the book. When the king heard the words of God... 
he has this reaction. In the Arabic culture, when somebody hears something that changes their life, they actually tear their garments. To this day in the Middle East, if you see videos online, people from that culture, when they hear something life-changing, they will tear their own garments. What does that symbolize? He rent his clothes. That means I'm tearing up my old identity. I am tearing up my old perception of who I am and how people perceive who I am so that I can receive new garments of a new life and a brand new identity and a new future and a new life course. I tear up what my plans were going to be to receive God's new future and God's new story for me. He sends his servants to inquire of the Lord, and God confirms direction for him and for his royal rule. God actually tells him by the mouth of a prophetess that he would be delayed in judgment, that God would not send judgment during his days. Why? Because he obeyed God. And just like King Josiah, if you obey God in like manner, God can push back judgment for a generation. Your obedience. Your submission to God can push away some bad scenarios and some bad possible incidents to come because you have placed yourself into the wheel of heaven. Chapter 23 now in verse 1. The following chapter in verse 1. After all that, the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king, he goes up into the house of the Lord, verse 2. See this. I love this part. And all the men of Judah, say all. all. And all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, say all again. It makes it clear here. They have to go up with him, don't they? The priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. It's like nobody was an exception. Whether you're a prophet, a priest, or a good old-fashioned Joe or Jane, you had to be in the house of God. There are no exceptions. I must be in the house of God. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Whoever we are, small and great, I must Go up to the house of God. He reads in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant. If it's like we think, if it was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that took a while, all right? To read all five of those books out loud, the king did that. That took time. This man was committed to the path of the Lord. He does this in the house of the Lord. And in verse 3, the king himself stands up and makes a covenant. And the people all agree that now they're going to turn this thing all around. Now they're going to leave false worship and go back to serving Jehovah God. And they do it. They abolish idol worship. In verse 14, the king broke in pieces the images, the idols, cut down the groves, the places of false worship, and he filled their places with the bones of men. Didn't I read that was going to happen a few chapters back in that prophecy? Right. And in verse 15, the altar that was at Bethel, the high place that Jeroboam had, it was there, and the king goes to it, and he broke it down. He burned that place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove around it, the periphery, anything even surrounding that false idol or touching it. It had to go. It couldn't influence me anymore in Jesus' name. There are some things like that grove in my life that are in the periphery, the surrounding of wrong decisions and bad roads, and it's got to go. It's got to be burned. Burned in the fire of the Holy Ghost. I can't allow it to go with me into God's new promised territory and my destiny ahead. Hallelujah. Verse 16, Josiah turns himself. He sees the tombs, the sepulchers where the false priests were buried. He gets their bones out and burns them upon the place where that false altar was and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed all the way back in 1 Kings 13. As God said it, it happened. 
Now, I had to preach to you all this to show you who Josiah is. He was a good king. He was a great king. He was a warrior. He was a revivalist. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's who he is. That's how God saw him. And this is the man in my opening who died. I read to you now of the life of King Josiah. Now I have broached the difficulty. Now I have broached his death once more. I already read in 2 Kings 23 about his death. Allow me to read a parallel passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 35 and verse number 20, if you'll go there and follow along with me. In this part of 2 Chronicles, you'll see that after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, he had finished his life's work. It was after all that. He had finished repairing the house of God. After all of that was done, and he completed the task of the Holy Ghost. Then the Pharaoh of Egypt, named Necho, came up to fight against Carchemish, the king of Assyria, at that river Euphrates. And Josiah goes out to fight that Pharaoh. If I look at the maps of Israel and Assyria and Canaan and Egypt, I see the following detail. That Pharaoh of Egypt had to pass through a portion of Israel territory to reach that battle place at that Euphrates River. All he was doing is he was passing through his territory to get to his battle. He was not going to fight King Josiah. And he tells him that in verse 21. He sends an ambassador out. And he says, what are you doing? What have I to do with you, you king of Judah? I am not coming against you this day, but against the house that I have war with. For here's something interesting. God told me to. God commanded me to make haste. It was a command from God. Follow this. The Pharaoh of Egypt just said, God talked to me and commanded me to fight the king of Assyria. Now, in all of our common sermons and parlance and Pentecost, Pharaoh in Egypt always stands for the world. Now, the king of the world, Pharaoh, just said, God spoke to me and commanded me to fight the king of Assyria. All of this story defies our common assumptions. It defies our assumptions that Josiah was eight years old and fulfilled the word of God. It defies our assumptions that this man, the Pharaoh of Egypt, was spoken to by God and commanded to fight the king of Assyria. But here it is. And so King Josiah has a choice, just like Hezekiah this morning also had a choice. King Josiah can choose not to fight and to leave this one alone. Or King Josiah can choose, you know what, I'm going to get involved in this. Ever heard or seen that happen before here in the house of the Lord? You see, Josiah was not that different from most of us. Josiah thought if Pharaoh passes through my territory, I can whop him. Anything that passes through the surroundings of my life, I can hit that thing on the head. I can get involved. I can put my hands and my fingers and my words into all of that business. I can have something to say, bless God. No, no, in Jesus' name, don't get involved in every single clown that passes down your street. Don't get involved with every single stupid battle that occurs near your territory. Just because somebody has some circus across the Town. That don't mean you have to ride the elephants and play with the monkeys, hallelujah. It's because they got a problem. Don't mean I got a problem. I can have peace in the midst of their storm. I can have peace that passes all understanding. God calls us to peace. <laughs> hallelujah. Any, anybody ever been scrolling through Facebook or social media here in the house of God and you see in your feed some just absolutely moronic post, and you think to yourself, I'm going to set them straight. Ever had that happen? You know what that was? That was a stupid battle, wasn't it? Bless God, I've been there. You've been there. We've all been there. Hallelujah. Josiah had a moment like that. He could have left this alone, 
but he didn't. Verse 22. Josiah, he would not turn his face. He couldn't be talked out of it. And I've been there too, shepherd. I have been at the dinner table or the desk or the office and talked to somebody, and most ministers have been there here. You have talked to somebody who's about to make a choice that's going to ruin their life, and you can't talk them out of it, and they won't listen to reason. They are not led by reason or by God. They are led by their flesh, aren't they? Okay. And Josiah was too. He could not be reasoned with. He could not be be discouraged from that choice, but he disguised himself. He tried to hide who he was. It's a strange day when an apostolic man has to hide himself and tries to disguise who he is. No good thing's going to come from that, okay? And he goes to fight with him, and here it makes it clear. He did not hearken to the word of Necho from the mouth of God. He did hear from God to go and fight that, that Assyrian king, didn't he? He goes to that valley in Megiddo. And in verse 23, we reach our first consequence. The first consequence of a stupid battle is that I get wounded. He entered a battleground that God told him not to enter. And he got hurt. And he got hit, and he got struck by an arrow. What quenches the fiery darts of the devil? The shield of faith, right? What quenches the enemy's efforts on tough days? The shield of faith. Faith in God will keep me out of stupid battlefields. Faith in God will keep me off of territories and landscapes that are dangerous to my life and to my family. He got hurt on a battleground God tried to have him avoid. And let's say it, many times we do get hurt, whether in life or in the house of the Lord. And there are times where we are not at fault, okay? That can happen. But there are also other times where, if we're honest, we are at fault. We were responsible. We entered a battleground that God told us not to enter. We went to a stupid battle God said not to go to. And Josiah did that. And when you enter a stupid battle God tried to have you avoid, we get hurt. He got hit by an archer of the enemy. They tried to fix him, you know, in verse 24. They tried to get him back to his city, to the city of Jerusalem. His servants took him out of the one chariot and put him likely into a faster chariot to get him out of the place of danger. But it was too late. If I go far enough into a wrong course and a bad choice, God is talking to somebody here in the house of the Lord, and he is trying to save your life and to save your ministry and to save your marriage from a stupid bad battleground that God doesn't want you to be on. God is trying to help you. God is trying to heal you. And God is trying to prevent that danger. Because that second chariot was not enough. He couldn't make it back to his city in time. Along the way, he died. When they brought him back to the city, he had already passed away. And they mourned for him. They mourned for him dearly. In verse 25, Jeremiah the prophet had a great lamentation for Josiah. Now, I'm scratching my head here. I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, you know, if Jeremiah the prophet was around, shouldn't he, you know, have, have sent for Jeremiah the prophet and say, you know, I should inquire of the Lord on what I should do here. Shouldn't I send for the man of God in my decision point instead of waiting and letting that man of God preach my funeral? Let him preach to me instead in the altar of sacrifice and preach in the revival service and give me a word from the Pentecostal pulpit. I need the voice of Jeremiah in my life while I'm still alive and breathing. Don't wait until it's too late to hear the word of God. He didn't sin for Jeremiah, did he? He did not consult with the man of God. Doesn't go to the altar of God and offer sacrifice. Doesn't pray and ask God for wisdom and direction. And without those things, without going to the house of God, without going to the altar of God, without praying about it or seeking the will of God, of course he blew it because I need the house of God, the man of God, my prayer life, and the altar of God. They keep me off of those stupid battlegrounds in the first place, don't they? Stupid battles are crazy things. They are fought by dumb people with 
dumb goals over dumb issues with bad weapons and stupid outcomes and deadly consequences. Everyone say, that's dumb. It was, wasn't it? You know, I've done that too. Josiah, he died and he lost his life. But the next to last consequence of this is even worse. Because I have done the awful arithmetic. You see, Josiah, when he died, they had a monarchy. They were a kingship, weren't they? And there were kings after Josiah. There were four kings after Josiah, ruling between 23 and 24 years. 24 years at most after Josiah lost his life on a stupid battlefield. 24 years after he died in Megiddo, the king of Babylon came, destroyed Jerusalem, and leveled the temple flat. He spent his life repairing the house of God. But when he fought that stupid battle, 24 years later, his life's work was reduced to rubble. All of it was undone by one bad decision. And that is what I feel that God is trying to prevent. He loves you. He wants you to have a legacy, a treasure to pass down generation to generation. That is the will of God. But bad battles and a wrong course of decision can undo all of it. It can imperil my children and my grandchildren in a manner that God never intended but you're not there yet, are you? You haven't lost your life. You are still here. You're still alive. You're still in this revival service, aren't you? And so you have the chance. You have the time. You have the altar call and the opportunity here in the house of the Lord. You can turn back. You can change your course. And you can be better. You can follow God's will. You can still repent. You can still be changed and transformed. And Josiah, he was not meant to die. Josiah was not supposed to lose his life. And in preaching all this about King Josiah, I have glossed over and ignored one big detail. Why did God send Pharaoh to fight the king of Assyria? Why did God even care? Why did God send the Pharaoh of Egypt to fight the king of Assyria? If you have your Bibles, go back to the 20th verse of 2 Chronicles chapter 35, okay? 35 and 20, 2 Chronicles. I already read this verse. I'm going to reread this verse. Josiah, he had finished his life's work. And the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, goes up to fight Carchemish, that king of Assyria. Where? Where was that battle supposed to take place? Euphrates River, right? At that river Euphrates. Footnote, Euphrates is not in Israel. That river Euphrates is not found in the country of Israel. Euphrates is in a totally different country called Iraq. And at that time, the country of Iraq had a different name. It was called Babylon. So they were going to fight at this river Euphrates in the territory of Babylon. And had the Pharaoh of Egypt come out on top, and God was with him, he would have come out on top. That Pharaoh would have taken that river Euphrates. And then 20 years later, when the king of Babylon would be about to attack Israel, he would not have been able to attack the Israelites because God would have placed a defense measure there called the Pharaoh of Egypt to block a danger the Babylonians, the Israelites didn't even know about. You see, in the margins, in the unseen, God was trying to defend them against the Babylonians, a danger they were unaware of. And in the margins of my life, so to speak, today God is trying to defend me and protect me and keep me safe from dangers I don't even know about. But God sees them, and God loves you, and God is working for you. Hallelujah. God is trying to build bulwarks and walls and protections. Had he let that battle alone, had he left the Pharaoh alone, Pharaoh would have been there to stop the king of Babylon 20 years later. But because Josiah thought, I'm going to do this, because Josiah did not 
ask God or pray or even consult God. But actually, I can't say that. Because God did tell him not to go, even though he did not pray, even though he did not seek the will of God, God still spoke one last warning by the mouth of an unexpected witness, by the mouth of a Pharaoh. God said he sent him to fight the king of Assyria. Don't interfere. Don't get involved. Stay out of it. Even at that last edge of the cliff, God is shouting one last warning to you in this penultimate revival service not to enter the battle fray. Don't go in that stupid battle. Don't lose your life but maybe you won't lose your life maybe you'll lose your marriage maybe you'll lose your ministry maybe you'll lose your children a relationship with friends or family members maybe you'll lose something precious or important something significant something of great worth precious in your eyes as you stand this evening that is what God is trying to stop he wants you to have your family. He wants you to have your marriage. He wants you to have your blessing. He wants you to have your posterity, your legacy, and your treasure. In closing, this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse number 19. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Jeremiah spent his life renovating the temple but God tells us in the New Testament that you are the temple of God. And like King Josiah, God has spent your life renovating the temple. God has been renovating you for 10 years, 5 weeks, 20 years, however long it is for you personally. God has Decades of time and building renovation projects invested in this tabernacle, this body of flesh. God has rewritten the course of years to come. And God has shored up the broken places and sealed the breaches and the soft spots. And God has made you beautiful in his eyesight. You are precious to the Lord. But in a moment of confusion, in a time of weakness or a day of darkness, if I'm not careful, in a fit of anger, I can go on some battlefield that God never meant for my feet to walk on. And I could be imperiled. And I could be in danger. And I could lose something important out of me. But I don't have to. I don't have to lose that. How do I stop it? I become a man of peace. 1 Peter 3, verses 10 and 11. God tells us this. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. You've got to hold back certain words and lips, they speak no guile. Verse 11. Let him eschew evil, run away from evil, do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. You'll have to seek for peace. Peace is not automatic. Peace is not some freebie with your pizza order tonight, okay? Peace is something you'll have to seek and ensue and purchase. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they are the children of God. You'll have to make peace. You'll have to seek peace. You'll have to sue peace. You'll have to work for peace. You'll have to speak peace like Jesus did on those stormy waters. You'll have to make peace your goal and your word for this day. Let this day and this week and this year be a year, a week, a day of peace for everybody here in this room. All across this service, these altars are open. Will you make your way one last time up to the altar up front here, the altar of God? And as you make your way, make this resolution. Ask God what area of life you are to make peace in. Be a peacemaker. Obey the Word of God. But preacher, I don't want to have peace with that person. Well, God didn't ask that. Just leave them alone. Don't try and run their life for them. Let them be them. Let Pharaoh be Pharaoh. But you be a Jew, Josiah. You be an Israelite. You be a son of God. Be holy and be a peacemaker.
Easter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have calm. Have joy. Have peace this evening. Seated or standing, find a place of prayer right now and let God move on your heart. You have the freedom to make peace. You have the calling of peace. You have the anointing of peace here in this room. We love you, Lord God. We are asking for your will in our lives. Bring me off the battlefield of death. Don't let me lose my life. God loves me enough to intervene and stop me. It is not just about me. It's about my kids, too. It's about my house. It's about my spouse. It's about everything of value in my life. I want them saved. I want them saved. I want them protected and defended. God is building the walls, the bulwarks, the defenses in ways I would not even expect. He is sending pharaohs to defend you that you would never even assume are there. But they're placed there by the appointing hand of God. They are there for a reason. There is no coincidence with us in the Holy Ghost. Nothing just happens. You are led by the Spirit. You are led. So many times I tried my way, but all of the pain didn't go away. Is that only you can give me this love that is so true? So many times I tried my way, but all of the pain didn't go away. And I realized that only you can give me this love that is so true. I want your glory, less of me and more of you is what I need. Show me your glory, oh, show me your power, less of me and more of you is what I need. 